I was born here and brought up here in Bhopal. The Hindus and Muslims have lived here for ages together without causing any harm to each other. If you go around, you will find there are beautiful lakes, there are beautiful hills, there are beautiful people. In 1982, Indian journalist Raj Kumar Kaswani begins writing about the Union Carbide pesticide plant in Bhopal. He predicts that unless safety standards are improved, poisonous gases used at the plant could leak out and kill thousands of people. I was writing that this is going to happen, but somewhere deep into my heart, I was thinking, no, it's not going to happen. Somebody is going to take care of it, and it is not going to happen. But Kiswani's warnings are ignored. At half past midnight on December 3rd, 1984, tons of poisonous gases spew out of the plant. Rajkumar Kiswani is among those caught in the killing cloud. So are thousands of others. Persons were screaming. The people were running here and there. Then as soon as we started going out, so many people came and rushed inside. They just jumped inside the bar. It was full of gas. My tears were coming out. What is happening? People are dying in front of us. I saw a lot of people lying on the road. Lots of people are being suffocated to death because of the toxic effect of the gas. That morning, even the birds stopped singing. The city of mosques becomes a gas chamber. Unofficial figures now put the death toll at 2,000. Many were blinded, many have permanent lung and eye damage, and approximately 200,000 others were exposed to the death The majority of the dead so far have been children and old people. Perhaps 17,000 are permanently disabled. Government officials admit that in the first few days after the leak from this plant, they purposely misreported the number of deaths. We'll do our best uh, to find out uh, what caused this problem to make sure uh, that everything can be done to help those that were injured. And now the unanswerable question is just how high the death toll will rise. Raj Kumar Kaswani is haunted by Bhopal. For 20 years, he's been searching for the truth about the disaster. Now he begins a quest across India and North America, determined to uncover suppressed scientific evidence that could finally bring justice to Bhopal's survivors. The good science is the only route to justice because so far, we have been going from this direction and that direction without any scientific basis. This, this, this science alone, again, can get the victims of Bhopal, get the justice. That's, that's my expectation and hope. What caused the accident is still in dispute. What Kaswani knows is that a metric ton of water entered a giant storage tank full of lethal chemicals, setting off a deadly reaction. Roiling gases overwhelmed the plant's safety systems that some claimed had been turned off to save money. Union Carbide later claimed it was an act of sabotage, but no saboteur was ever identified. <laughs> Thousands of people are buried and cremated in those first days. But truth dies, too. Right from the start, there's an effort to erase evidence about the scale of the disaster. But survivors can't forget. Jagdish Nima volunteered at the cremation grounds that night. <laughs> Jagdish Nima 
मिल गया कब गया उसकी खूबसूरती में आपको बता नहीं सकता इसी बार ईश्वर की गजब के जो अभी भगवान के आज भी मतलब ये कि वो उसकी वो मेरी आंखों के सामने आ जाता है इतना सुंदर और इतना भोला बच्चा कि जिसका जवाब मैं ये समझ लीजिए आप मैंने आपसे कहा ना कि उस, उस वक्त भी मैंने अपनी आँख से एक आँसुनी बहाया न जाने कौन सी शक्ति थी जो मुझे उन बातों पर रोकी हुई थी मगर मैं जिस वक्त बच्चे को मैंने अंदर उतारा मैं भग भगा के रो दिया ईश्वर की कसम कई बार तो यही यही वो सब जगह है People are cast to live with this horror because we haven't moved an inch from where we were on December third, nineteen eighty-four. One, they were victimized by the disaster caused by the Union car ride. Now the other disasters are being caused by the government, by the bureaucracy, by the politicians, by some of the vested interest in the society. In the 20 years since the disaster, the government of India has suppressed research into the gas's effect on human cells, genes, and embryos. And there's been little interest in the West to study what happened in Bhopal. The poison past hangs over the place. Union Carbide never cleaned up the site. It left hundreds of tons of pesticides and processed chemicals here. Kaswani finds them seeping into the soil and into the lives of nearby residents. Near the rusting plant, Greenpeace found mercury in well water up to six million times expected levels. It also found the breast milk of nursing mothers polluted with poisons and dangerous levels of trichloroethene, a chemical shown to impair fetal development. These toxic materials have seeped into the system and the water has become completely polluted, undrinkable, that's a poison. And that's what the people are suffering. And everybody knows about that. Abdul Jabbar Khan has been leading the fight for victims' rights since 1984. <laughs> कि हम लोगों को ये खिताब से अगर कहीं नहीं जीन देना सरकार को तो हम लोगों को सेल पास देगा सबको गेल पास कर दे सरकार तो वो बहुत सही सही बात है सही बात है सही बात है इस बात पे बाकुदा में ये रोना आता क्या अरे कुछ नहीं कुछ अरे ऐसा नहीं अरे पानी मांग रहा है आपने कुछ नहीं मांगा अरे आपने कह द आपकी बात ही तो इसीलिए तो पूछा आपसे आप तो खड़े हुए थे चिल्ला के बुलाया है देखिए आज अमेरिका जो है सबसे बड़ा आलम बर्दार बनता है शांति का पीस का और आप देखें कि जो डिजास्टर हुआ भोपाल डिजास्टर वो भी एक तरह का आतंक था मल्टीनेशनल्स कंपनी का अमेरिकन मल्टीनेशनल्स कंपनी का तो जब डिजास्टर हुआ तो वहाँ की सीनेट होती है पार्लियामेंट होती जो भी उन्होंने यूसीसी को कभी बाध्य नहीं किया कि आप भोपाल के लोगों को जस्टिस दो जो मेडिकल इन्फॉर्मेशन है वो प्रोवाइड करो कि जो थर्ड वर्ल्ड कंट्रीज के लोग हैं उनका जीवन जो है कीड़े मकोड़ों से ज़्यादा नहीं है और जो जस्टिस की बात करते हैं वो सिर्फ जस्टिस की बात करते हैं अपने लोगों के लिए ना कि सारी दुनिया के लोगों a conspiracy of silence makes the possibility of justice remote in Bhopal. Without scientific information linking the disaster to long-term health effects, survivors can't establish claims for
for fair compensation. The people of Bhopal didn't always hate Union Carbide. In 1968, Bhopal welcomes the American multinational. The company sets up a pesticide plant to help India reach its goal of agricultural self-sufficiency. But right from the start, there are problems. Among the chemicals used to make the pesticides were phosgene and methyl isocyanate, known as MIC, one of the most lethal chemicals ever created. Union Carbide stored huge quantities of the volatile MIC gas on site. But it was the phosgene gas that first threatened Bhopal. In 1981, there was an accident while a plant worker cleaning the pipeline got exposed to the phosgene and uh, two days later he died because of that. Then I realized that there is something very serious and I should not take it very lightly. I have been just ignoring. And from there onwards, I started investigating. The phosgene was used in the Second World War and was used by Hitler in his gas chambers. So I said, if phosgene is a part of MIC, so that is going to kill the people. The Indian Supreme Court eventually set the number of deaths at 3,000. Dr. N. P. Mishra knows otherwise. He was the head of the Hamidia Hospital, Ground Zero, where 60,000 people came to be treated that night. Approximately 2,500 people died immediately, but we had approximately 10,000 deaths in the first month following disaster. We distributed medicines to 170,000 patients in one single day. And all of them were victims of this gas episode. If you inhale, immediately it affects uptake of oxygen by tissues, and the person immediately dies. This is the fastest poison that we know of. They did inform me at about midnight that the gas has leaked. When I asked them what is the gas, they told me that it is methyl isocyanate. I also asked them what should be done, what is your advice according to information that you might be having on your books. They said it's, uh, it's not going to produce much harm. You only ask people to put wet cloth in front of their face so that it gets dissolved and does not enter the symptom. Two days after the disaster, Union Carbide's medical experts face a room full of Indian medical workers and the press. We have run an operation like this for 20 or 90 to 20, 20, whatever number of years, and we never had anything like this. So how can you give information or something? But suppose such a contingency arises, what do you do in the United States? What do you do? We would do the same thing you did here, which is to... We did nothing. People are driving like flies. My main aim was to find out if anybody knows what is the antidote to methyl isocyanate. They had no answer to this problem. Uh, this is uh, uh, the first episode that uh, methyl isocyanate exposure has been uh, available for study under these conditions of human exposures, I've already said. Therefore, no one today can say absolutely with any assurance what the future holds. The significant long-term effect that it produced was that progressively their lung function declined. There's absolute evidence for that. Uh, based on the information we have, methyl isocyanate cannot directly get to the uterus. There is no reason or concern. Uh, to say that there is going to be any kind of a genetic or a, you know, intrauterine uh, effect on a, baby, a grow, growing baby in a mother's womb. Like so many of its assumptions, Union Carbide's claim that the gas will have no effect on fetuses is now being questioned. We don't know anything about it, but we've told you that this gas is a very common gas, and there will be a little bit of a problem, and it will be finished. We can't do it. 
Dr. Aru Sepati was desperate to understand exactly what had leaked out of the Union Carbide plant. Today, he's chief of the Medico Legal Institute in Bhopal. इस तरह हमने कम से कम तीन हजार पोस्टमार्टम किए और कम से कम चार पांच हजार एक्सटर्नल फ्यूचर के आधार पर हमने डिसाइड कर दिया। Union Carbide का जो टैंक नंबर 610 था, उसमें 22 टन केमिकल रखा हुआ था। सभी केमिकल उड़ने के बाद उसमें जो रेसिड्यू बच गया था उस रेसिड्यू को हमने एनालिसिस किया उसमें 22 टॉक्सिक कंपाउंड्स हमें मिले अब हमने जो आदमियों के ब्लड और टिश्यू का एनालिसिस किया अब प्रश्न ये उठता है कि आइदर दिस कंपाउंड्स दे आर द नॉर्मल मेटाबॉलाइट्स ऑफ द बॉडी नो तो हमने यूनियन कार्बाइड को इस तरह हमने रिस्पांसिबल ठहराया डिजास्टर के टाइम के हैं और उसके बाद ये डैमेज अधिक देखने को मिला क्योंकि डिजास्टर में जो मर गए उनमें उतना इफेक्ट नहीं पड़ पाया पर उसके बाद जो तीन माह चार माह छह माह या एक साल तक जिंदा रहे उनमें ये डैमेज हमको बहुत देखने को इसका मतलब ये हुआ कि उसका कंटिन्यूअस जो है डैमेज प्रोसेस जो है वो जारी रहा जारी रहा 19/4/2001 को इसका हमने पोस्टमार्टम किया था अब जब हमने इस बॉडी का पोस्टमार्टम किया तो आप देख रहे हैं कि देयर इज अ एबनॉर्मलिटी इन द बॉडी द इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग इन दिस पर्टिकुलर केस वाज दैट द मदर वाज सीवियरली गैस अफेक्टेड सिंस 1984 शी वाज रेसिडेंट नियर द यूनियन कार्बाइड कैची छोला एंड शी वाज हैविंग कांस्टेंट कंटीन्यूअस ट्रीटमेंट फॉर द गैस एंड सी डिलीवर दिस चाइल्ड तो ये जो एक बात चलती है कि लॉन्ग टर्म इफेक्ट्स और जेनेटिक डिसऑर्डर से ये तो उससे जो है उसकी तरफ इशारा करता है कि इसकी जो है बहुत स्ट्रांग पॉसिबिलिटीज मौजूद हैं बिल्कुल स्ट्रांग पॉसिबिलिटी मौजूद है और इस तरह का स्टडी मैं हमेशा बोल रहा हूं कि इसका स्टडी होना बहुत जरूरी है चाहे वो स्टडी का रिजल्ट पॉजिटिव निकले चाहे नेगेटिव निकले चाहे केवी भी निकले तो हमेशा मानव समाज के लिए भोपाल वासियों के लिए वो हमेशा पॉजिटिव ही रहेगा कम से कम नेगेटिव निकलेगा तो कम से कम हम भोपाल वालियों को ये तो पता चल जाएगा कि इसका लॉन्ग टर्म जेनेटिक इफेक्ट नहीं है और यदि पॉजिटिव निकला तो उसका उपाय क्या है सोचा जाएगा तो इसका स्टडी बहुत जरूरी है इमेजिन अ होल सिटी हेल्ड हॉस्टेज बाय फियर अनशुर इवन नाउ हाउ मच द गैस हैज अफेक्टेड देम देयर आर डजंस ऑफ हॉस्पिटल्स dozens and dozens of hospitals because this city has become a city of hospitals but my question is does the presence of these doctors in these hospitals and the kind of medicine they distribute really help in any manner to any extent to these victims no unfortunately the answer is no the only cure to them is death and nothing else. The question of compensation and liability is an extremely complicated one, not only involving the victims, but also the governments of India and the state of Madhya Pradesh. When news of the disaster reaches Union Carbide's headquarters in the United States, Anderson flies to Bhopal. He's immediately arrested, perhaps for his own protection. But Anderson is soon released and flies back to the United States, never to return to face the criminal charges that remain outstanding to this day. Now, I just want to say to shareholders of Union Carbide that I am confident that the victims can be fairly and equitably compensated without a material adverse effect on the financial condition of Union Carbide Corporation. Anderson promises his shareholders they won't lose money. Union Carbide sells off parts of the company and becomes a smaller target for lawsuits. In 1989, the Indian Supreme Court secretly brokers a settlement with Union Carbide for $470 million. The deal saves the multinational from bankruptcy and it quashes all criminal charges against senior executives. The government of India submitted a wrong information to the Supreme Court. The court was told that the number of death cases was just 3,000. These are not the actual figures. There are 15,000 deaths. And when you open it to the people, there are more than 500,000 victims you are compensating. 
क्या आप पच्चीस हजार रुपया मुआवजा लेने को तैयार हैं या उससे ज्यादा मुआवजा चाहती हैं सो ऑल दिस मिसलीडिंग इन्फॉर्मेशन हैव कॉज दिस है When we speak of the compensation, the amount is 470 million dollars, and when we look at an individual gas victim, he has got just 500 dollars. That is in almost the 90 percent cases. They are left with no money. Gas victims groups can only protest the settlement that grossly underestimates the human cost of the disaster. Outraged by this injustice, Raj Kumar Kaswani feels compelled to step out of his journalist's role. Oh, one character which really guided me into this, that is Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi himself was a journalist, and he always would. Say in his writings, there are situations when a journalist should come out from the role of a journalist and should go beyond that. Because if there are situations which involves the people and their well-being, you should go all out to help them. India's Supreme Court does reinstate criminal charges against Warren Anderson. But it refuses to reconsider its settlement with Union Carbide. Kaswani is one of the first to demand that the victims be given legal standing. His lawyer was Indira Jai Singh. The money, the money was going to go into the hands of the victims, and they certainly had something to say for themselves. The Supreme Court was not bothered; they didn't even listen to them. They just said, "Okay, Union of India and Union Carbide have entered into a settlement. So what have we got to do with it? You know, it was a hands-off attitude." Twenty years later. Indira Jai Singh continues to champion the cause of gas victims for fair compensation. I think it had more to do with uh, the need of, uh, you know, countries to have bilateral uh, good relationship, and um, I think uh, it was the will of the multinational company that prevailed. And to some extent, I think the government of India also did not want. A full-fledged trial, because there might have been some degree of fear that a trial would actually bring out a lot of issues, which would point to the negligence of the government as well, as much as it pointed to the negligence of Union Carbide Corporation. The cloud emanated from the plant and went down through the living quarters adjacent to the plant. You couldn't see it. Union Carbide's Warren Anderson claims the effects of methyl isocyanate gas are limited to the eyes and lungs. This is a pulmonary respiratory kind of a difficulty, and it attacks the eyes. It goes after youngsters. I'm talking children now, and older people who don't have the the lung capacity. But independent scientists eventually find that MIC can penetrate the body's internal tissues. It's the lack of officially supported medical research that brings together concerned scientists. The International Medical Commission on Bhopal is founded in 1994 by Canadian scientist Dr. Rosalie Brutel. Probably Bhopal was one of the first of the new kind of disasters, where with time it increases. You you find more people that are sick that you didn't know in the beginning. But the government stopped the research, as you probably know. They cut off all the research on the genetic effects. In fact, they're not funding any research now. On the night of the disaster, gas traveled beyond the low-lying shanties into middle-class neighborhoods. Families here live with the same uncertainty about the causes of their medical afflictions as do the poor. Dr. Narayan Ganesh is one of the few local researchers studying the long-term genetic effects. Good evening. Eve four five. All five fingers are there, but this tarsal matter also got joined. Uh, all the baby who born after the gas, they got a pigeon chest. 
you can see. This a simple one single family shows multiple malformation and a cancer association in the single united family. This ridiculous and shameful for the society where we are living. Dr. Ganesh has documented dozens of birth defects in Bhopal, but Kaswani knows that his anecdotal evidence is no substitute for well-funded genetic research. Volunteer scientists who come to Bhopal from around the world meet official resistance at every turn. Dr. Raman Adar experienced the frustration firsthand. We found the stumbling blocks were that when we tried to get information that had already been collected by the government on the disaster, uh, that information was not adequately forthcoming. When we spoke to the Indian Council of Medical Research as to their findings on the disaster, they stated that their hands were tied because uh, the, there were other government ministries which did not permit them to publish uh, the findings. And when we spoke to the other government ministries, they turned around and said, but no, we have not uh, prevented the publication of these. So these kinds of bureaucratic uh, problems existed and that has resulted in you know, our not being able to gather any information on the data that's already been collected you know, by the government. Unfortunately, whatever the studies were carried out, these have not really reached at any conclusion other than that the more studies are required. So, so does, that doesn't help. So the more studies, but then by the time your studies come to an end, the people would have died. Perhaps the most desperate survivors are the widows whose husbands were killed by the gas. Traditionally scorned as bearers of bad luck, the widow in India has no status and few advocates. The widows implore Kaswani to tell the world of their plight. I don't really know how to react to these situations. A fledgling women's movement is rising from the ashes of Bhopal. Community organizer Hamida B lost 22 members of her family in the disaster. Now she offers training and jobs to other women and girls. Raj Kumar Kaswani's search for justice takes him on his first trip to the United States. He joins Bhopal activists at the annual shareholders meeting of the Dow Chemical Company. Tomorrow, 
In 2001, Dow acquired Union Carbide. Now, socially responsible investors opposed to Dow's practices worldwide join the cause of Bhopal. With $40 billion in assets, Dow is one of the largest chemical companies in the world. I'm very pleased to welcome you all of you to the 107th annual meeting of your company. 2003 was another challenging year, but for Dow, I think it was a rewarding one. Sales increased 18% from $27 billion to $33 billion. The only goal of greater importance was our safety and environmental performance. They're supposed to be the women's photos. Bhopal activist Satu Sarangi is front page news in the company town of Midland, Michigan. But at Dow, the company line remains the same. All we can say is that we're, you know, deeply distressed about the, the horrific tragedy, but, you know, we did not cause it. We did not have any involvement in it. If Dow feels guilty, they would help, you know? But, but don't they, you think that they owe some moral responsibility because well, they have... That I, I couldn't answer you that really, you know? It's a bad thing. It's a bad thing. Dow concedes nothing in Midland, but there are victories and the world finally takes notice. At the San Francisco Opera House, two Bhopal survivors, Rashida B. and Champa Devi, are awarded the prestigious Goldman Prize for environmental activism. <laughs> Thank you. Kaswani's journey takes him to Philadelphia in search of an old ally. <laughs> you look the too. same after 20 years. <laughs> Wonderful. In the months after the disaster, Kaswani collaborated with New York Times journalist Stuart Diamond on a series of front page exposés about Union Carbide's violation of basic safety regulations. Carbide claimed the accident was an act of sabotage. We found no evidence of sabotage when we were there. And I guess my conclusion is that even if there was a disgruntled employee who did something untoward, that was the straw that broke the camel's back in a vast non-working system in which workers were not properly trained, equipment malfunctioned, there was a lack of oversight, people lived close to the plant in violation of the city's own master plan, causing many more deaths. Do you really think that the response of American government should have been different or was, yeah, just okay, they did what they, they, they should have? The U.S. government's response was adequate because it was a private company in a foreign country. Was the U.S. government's response right? Well, how does the rest of the world feel about the United States? Um, a lot of people in developing countries don't see any material difference between accidents such as Bhopal and acts of terrorism such as the World Trade Center. A lot of people died as a result of uh, misuse of technology by someone from another country. Union Carbide put that plan in that environment. It was Union Carbide's responsibility to ensure its technology was used safely. But safety is the responsibility of people who operate in our plants. As and months can, and years and pass, Warren nature, Anderson denies Union Carbide's responsibility for the disaster. Now we're saying that water got into that tank. He blames local how, Indian employees for what went wrong in Bhopal. They operated that plant not in conformance with operating procedures. A whole series of them. Today, there's still concern over double standards for international safety. Dr. Rosalie Bertel worries that there may be other Bhopals waiting to happen. 
countries need to have laws that multinational corporations will follow and that they have to follow or they'll be put out. So uh, they, like, they never had uh, an, an evacuation plan at that plant. They never uh, had practices for what to do in an emergency. Uh, they have no laws that demand that of a hazardous industry moving in. Union Carbide did not follow uh, the laws it would have to follow for the same plant in the United States. Those are really important things to go for because otherwise it will happen again. The U.S. has tough environmental liability laws, which is why, in 1985, India tries to sue Union Carbide in this New York court. But Judge John Keenan rules that what could become the biggest lawsuit in history will not be heard in the United States, but in India. This is the place. Uh, this is a federal court. Ryan Mooney was a lawyer for Union Carbide. Mooney was sent to India after the disaster to help prepare the company's defense. The Bhopal case was heard. Was heard. But he soon quit and wrote a thesis criticizing the legal systems of India and the United States. You can look at similar cases in the United States and the settlements are in the billions. Everything in the legal system is set up for equality. It's egalitarian and yet it doesn't operate that way. Um, because Through things like the proof you have to offer of uh, medical damage. Now everyone gets their day in court, they can offer the evidence, but if you don't have the financial wherewithal to offer the evidence, the egalitarian framework of the law doesn't matter, but this one isn't over, and uh, the people who were injured need to have the opportunity to tell their story still. It took 9-11 to bring back the memory of Bhopal for many Americans. Though 9-11 was a premeditated attack on innocent victims, and Bhopal was a tragic accident, many can't help compare the shocking events. I had to think of Bhopal that day, because people were running, clouds of same, smoke same, coming same, behind them. Yeah. Similar amount of area in the middle of a city, also, shocking. The, the terror uh, is similar Absolutely. that people experience when they don't know what's happening. So, nobody knows what they breathed in that day. Quite haunting. In the aftermath of the 9 11 attack, the human devastation caused in Bhopal was used by New Jersey Senator John Corzine and, uh, to dramatize the threat of terrorist attacks right. on Absolutely. U.S. chemical plants. In those times, the multinationals were treated like a god. Right. Because they are most welcome and there was no questions to be raised about them. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes I think the chemical industry here in the United States is today treated like gods. Um, uh, almost every expert with regard to um, uh, terrorism uh, would point out that we have these chemical plants, not unlike in Bhopal, that are located in these highly densely populated areas and uh, they become potential targets for terrorism to use the materials that's in the plant to attack the general public. Not unlike Bhopal, you know, these plants were built where people are. But in the last three years since when you have started working on this, what has been the general response? Zero. And the reason they haven't taken an aggressive attitude is because uh, we have these companies lobbying both uh, Congress and the administration in a way that says, we want to protect our profits more than we want to protect the people who live in and around it. And I think it's shameful. He has been trying to raise the issue through newspapers and going to the plants and doing this and that. Everything possible, in fact. And still, no public opinion. So that's quite shocking. That shows how 
mighty and powerful these lobbies are. In Las Vegas, Kaswani meets Romana Dara, a U.S. Department of Energy consultant. Born in India, Dr. Dara raced to Bhopal after the disaster, wanting to help. He's donated years of his time in epidemiological research, determined to establish exactly what came out of the Union Carbide plant that terrible night. What were the decomposition products that were formed inside the tank? Was it only isocyanate that blew out of the tank, or were there you know, lots of other chemicals that came out? Are questions that we were wondering whether this facility might be able to simulate. Here in the Nevada desert, the U.S. government tested its atomic bombs. Today, it's a hazardous materials test facility. We have a vertical profiler. It'll, it'll uh, uh, profile the winds aloft. We have the tank farm, uh, the 23,000 gallon tanks. I'm not sure how it would compare to the... To the Bhopal one. Yeah, to the MIC. So this would encompass the community? Yes. Bhopal. Yeah, any plume that comes out from here mm. has enough of an area of space enough, enough. to simulate yeah. what happened. Yeah. All right. There. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks. It was a pleasure Thank meeting you. you. Yes. Recreating the Bhopal gas leak will cost $2 million. Yes. This has been my dream now for yeah, the last this, yeah, this, 15 this, years yeah, to do that, this. That's, that's it I'm may saying. take a couple of years to raise the money, but Dr. Dara is confident that the U.S. Department of Homeland Security will provide the funds. It's ironic that U.S. fear of terrorism may finally help us understand what happened in Bhopal at a chemical plant owned by a U.S. multinational. It's been a long journey for Raj Kumar Kaswani through the scientific uncertainties and the political bog of Bhopal. He finally finds a breakthrough in Montreal. <laughs> At McGill University, toxicologist Daya Varma's groundbreaking research is directly linking the gas disaster to birth defects today. But from the research point of view, I was mainly concerned, what will MIC do? in pregnant women. Dr. Varma has found a relationship between exposure to methyl isocyanate and growth retardation in children. 3,270 families, the males born of exposed parents or exposed when they were still in uterus, uh, they are much shorter than their healthy cohorts from areas where no gas leak took place. And this effect is quite remarkable. It can be as much as 9, 10, 11 centimeters, almost 4 or 5 inches, inches. Yeah. Yeah. which is a lot. Dr. Diavarma's research is funded by the Canadian government and recently published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. This is not the His research suggests that a byproduct of MIC, trimethylamine, may be responsible for growth retardation even in children born years after the gas leak. Bhopal is a new kind of disaster where the number of victims grows over time. This kind of studies have already established what is the truth. And further studies, as Dr. Verma says he's going to conduct, would reveal a lot more. And that is, that is something very precious to the entire human race. Mm -hmm. Back home in Bhopal, Rajkumar Kaswani visits one of the subjects in Dr. Daya Varma's study. He's taken to the young man's home by activist Satu Sarange. 18-year-old Jagdish lives with his mother. She gave birth to him two years after being exposed to the gas. The data we have collected now, that deals with more than 1,000 children. And what we found was that children who were conceived and born after the disaster or children were, who were in utero, in their mother's womb, 
-hmm. Among them, we know that boys have been affected in terms of height, weight. We know that girls also are affected, but in a different way. They start their periods very late. They have extremely painful menstruation. Their cycles are completely chaotic. When the settlement occurred in 89, there was no knowledge of this. So we are talking of a very different order of liability and continuing liability. Rajkumar Kaswani convinces Babalal Gore, one of the most powerful politicians in the state, to visit the poor gas widow whose tale has so moved him. I will try to It sounds like a lot, but a thousand rupees is just twenty dollars. The minister's visit becomes a media event. There are thousands of widows with similar stories. But not everyone can expect a government job. I'm glad that the lady got some help. But at the same time, I know the reality that she's not the lone person who's suffering in this way. But he said he's going to take up this issue with the union government that they should be giving a thousand rupee monthly pension to each and every widow. Survivors can't rely on a politician's whimsy for justice. Real hope lies in reopening the 1989 settlement with Union Carbide, now owned by Dow, and in the activist movement. Rashida B. and Champa Devi return from America with their Goldman Prize, optimistic it will bring world attention to their cause. <laughs> In the summer of 2004, the 20 year long legal battle begun by lawyer Indira Jai Singh and Raj Kumar Kaswani reaches a new phase. Indira Jai Singh is petitioning the Supreme Court to reopen the government of India's 1989 settlement with Union Carbide. Yes, there is a very good case to go back to court and ask for the reopening of the settlement. The number of dead, assumed to be 2,000, has now proved to be 15,000. The number of injured, which was uh, put at about 30,000, has now exceeded 500,000. And there is epidemiological evidence to indicate that the uh, injuries which were caused are chronic, are long-term, and are genetic. We've now discovered through 20 years of epidemiological research at great cost. Disciplining multinational corporations is international responsibility. You need treaties on issues like this. 
uh, you need laws in their own countries which say you can't have double standards, you can't go to developing countries and operate with lower standards of safety. So I think the world community has to take responsibility for this. It's not, the, it's this responsibility doesn't rust on the shoulders of the victims of the Bhopal tragedy. Justice is measured not in years, but in decades and generations in Bhopal. Thousands upon thousands died and were maimed, and still they wait for truth. Many hold a single multinational corporation responsible, but proof is necessary. Medical research must continue, must be properly funded for victims past and future. International safety standards must become a basic human right for all. We owe it to the dead and the dying. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim.